I've got the privilege of introducing Derek. He told me to be quick because uh, he's going to challenge me to say the most today. The uh, thing about Derek is uh, he shares that same passion for, for what we do as uh, what I have. And so it's a real pleasure to have been involved with him for uh, a long time now. Uh, I didn't actually stay at Lincoln long enough to get him in the classroom there, but it's uh, a whole lot more fun in the field. And the thing I always say about Derek is there's a whole lot of people out there that know a heap of stuff that are really good at science. Derek's one of those guys that knows a whole lot of stuff and is really good at telling that message so that average Joes like us can pick it up and run with it. So uh, without any more, Derek Mate from Lincoln University. Thanks, Fraser, and thanks for the opportunity of speaking today. Um, it's a, a real privilege for, to be here. And I, I, I sort of was wondering about what I was going to talk about, and I thought, well, He's given me the topic of Lucerne, but I stopped talking about Lucerne management in 2008 on this farm because I did a field day and I asked the questions and got the answers from either Doug or Fraser that were exactly the answer that I would have given. So I sort of thought, well, they actually know as much, if not more, than I do about managing Lucerne. So I thought I'd go back to um, where it all began for me and talk a little bit about climate change and why the system that we've developed here um, is actually very good from a climate change perspective. I just want to acknowledge the people that have supported my research over the years. I'm currently involved with a, a Hill Country Futures program that Beef and Lamb and, and MB are involved with, along with Wrightsons and Seedforce. And I'm a spokesperson for um, a lot of people who work with me at Lincoln University, and I'm delighted that there's uh, about 11 of us here today, many postgraduate students from overseas and technicians that have been involved in the work that I do at Lincoln, and they give me the opportunity to come and talk um, with you today. So I'm very pleased to be able to have them up at this field day to, to be able to see your farm. I often talk about it, and so they're going to get a chance to see it. Um, I, I just want to put this up. This is from the National Science Challenge, Our Land and Water, which I'm not involved with, but I thought the diagram was really good. What it came out was they surveyed a whole lot of people from policy, from government, from um, agribusiness community, and said, what are the things that are going to drive land use change in New Zealand over the next 100 years? And the three came up very clearly. This is a bubble diagram. The size of the bubble is how many times it was presented. And climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, and consumer preferences were the three that came up um, as the most that, they were, um, that people were thinking about. And so what I wanted to do is, is we talk, Barry talked earlier about having a helicopter look at the farm. I sort of want to go on a satellite. I want to go right up and have a look at satellite view of Bon Avery and how it fits in the world, as opposed to how it fits into Marlborough. So when I started working on climate change, it was about 1996, and there were 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And for those that need a little recap, three main gases for, for climate change, carbon dioxide, um, nitrous oxide, and methane. And all of them actually just trap um, moisture. They trap uh, molecules of water, which then gives us a blanket, which then actually gives us the, the warming that we have. And the Earth's warmed about 0.85 of a degree um, over the last 50 years or so. So this is um, the, the numbers. And What's happened is that that CO2 has basically come about because in my lifetime we've moved from having about 3 million people on the planet to having close to 8 million people on the planet. And if you have more people, you need more energy. And it's a pretty straight line relationship that as we've got more people, we've had more energy. And the source of that energy has pretty much come from burning fossil fuels. So here's um, traditional biofuels if people are burning wood or um, using it for cooking or heating. But keep an eye on about 1960, because that's really when things started to change. And for most of us, this is within our lifetime. So here's the uh, energy production from coal, from crude oil, from natural gas. Huge increase in turning fossil fuel into atmospheric CO2. There's the contribution of nuclear energy to that total energy budget. And there's everything else, solar, wind, hydro, etc. So I think it's fairly salutary to just have a look at that data and realise what's happening. This has huge geopolitical implications. This is one of the reasons that um, the, the US has not really gotten engaged in the, the whole climate change issue because they're one of the major producers of the fossil fuels. 
So there's a lot of other things that happen. My um, message for that is that we can look at how much New Zealand produces, which is the green bar here, and we're not really a major producer of um, emissions on, a, on a, um, tons of CO2 equivalent, and nor is a country like Nigeria where you could say, well, there's 200 million people and it's increasing hugely, um, therefore it's all the, the people that are having lots of babies' fault. No, it isn't. Actually, the greenhouse gases are pretty much um, related to those industrialised nations, and, and the US sitting at the top, and the UK down um, in the, the triangles there, and then we've got an increase through to China, because essentially when climate change started to become an issue, most of the US and um, Europe abdicated responsibility for producing goods and sent it to China and said, well, you do it, and now we can point the finger at you for producing all the greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a, a fairly interesting situation. Um, the, the, client, the, the world doesn't actually care where the emissions come from, it just has some responses. And here is the loss of Antarctic ice melt over time, and then Greenland's um, ice mass going down as well, and that's why Donald Trump was interested in buying Greenland, because it was land that was coming available that he could explore for oil. That was pretty much the reason he wanted to buy. Um, and we have an increase in sea level rise of about 3.3 millimetres per year. So these are real, and this is data and all of the stuff. I'm a scientist, so I present data with um, stuff here. Um, so there's always a source here that you can pick up where this data has come from. So this is not going to go away. Climate change isn't going to disappear. From a New Zealand perspective, um, you can see the top line there is our increased transport emissions that are occurring over time. This is our CO2 emissions by sector. And you can see the forestry here, which is our major sink. And we were doing quite nicely in the 1990s, and then about here we had a huge amount of deforestation. Anything that was going to become a pasture became a pasture. And so this caused some real headaches for our governments of both hues, whether it be red or blue, is, well, how do we offset these increasing emissions? We used to do it with forestry. And so you start to get an idea as to why the um, policies have, that have been developed come into being. It's because we've, we've had this land use change with forestry. And then we look at the agricultural sector. If the previous graph actually doesn't have agriculture on it because the emissions of CO2 from agriculture are all counted within the transport sector or the building sector and those sorts of sectors. But when we get to um, the other greenhouse gas emissions or the total, then agriculture comes out as being you know, a major emitter. And we're all aware of that, we've heard that. So I just wanted to give you the data. Um, and one of those major emissions is methane, the agricultural production from the rumen um, there, and not a lot coming from anything else. Um, and then our per capita emissions of methane are going down, so it looks like we're going, doing a really good job. The difficulty with that is that we, when we started in 1990, there were about three and a half million of us. And this is per capita, so it's per person. Now we've got about, by here, when the latest data, about four and a half million or 4.8 million. So actually all we've done is increase the number of people. So the divisor in the maths goes down, so it makes it look good. But actually um, it isn't, it's just there are more people. But you can see from a global perspective, the emphasis for us is on the agricultural emissions because we're high from a global perspective. And if we want to maintain market access, if we want to produce products that we can um, talk about and say uh, these are produced sustainably, then we have to address these issues. And that's why politicians talk about it. The other emission is nitrous oxide, which predominantly comes from um, the use of nitrogen fertiliser and um, urine emissions as well. And the same pattern, New Zealand being well above all the other countries in terms of its emissions, because we are an agricultural country. And so these are the drivers, um, and I don't want anyone to be despondent about that, that's just the data, that's what it is. Well, all I'm trying to say at this point is um, that it's not going to go away. We're going to have to deal with these things in the future. And one of the responses to, climate ch to um, those emissions is obviously climate change, and the predictions for New Zealand effectively can be summarised quite easily. The east gets drier and the, the west gets wetter, and that's pretty much what's happening. Now, a legitimate response to the idea that the largest area of flat land in the country is going to get drier is to actually put irrigation on it. Quick question. Um, you got per capita emissions. What about per, per unit of nutrition or food? 
I'll come to that towards the end, and, and I'll take the questions afterwards if that's all right, because this man here is going to keep me to time. Okay. Um, so one of the legitimate responses to climate change would be to irrigate, and so that's what we did on the Canterbury Plains. I mean, this is one of the most productive parts of the world. 17.4 tonnes of wheat, the world record that Eric Watson's just produced um, at Wakanui. This is a very productive landscape. We wouldn't really irrigate stones if we had a whole lot of deep soils, but we don't. We've got flat areas and some of them are actually very stony, so we've irrigated them. And so this is what happened when we irrigated um, land, is one of the first experiments over to Lincoln was to look at um, what would happen for just a grass-based pasture if I just added nitrogen or I added water or I added water and nitrogen. To, to essentially say what happens as I convert from dryland farming to dairying. And some of you will have seen this data before, but we produced about 6.3 tonnes of dry matter um, from that dryland system. If we ju just add water, it's actually a little bit disappointing. We get about 10 tonnes of dry matter. For any of you that are here that are from a, a wetter environment on the west, this is pretty much your pasture production profile because you're not going to get a response to moisture in the spring because your soil's generally got moisture and this is going to be your response in the summer. So this is what we traditionally would call summer safe country. That sort of summer safe, you've got some moisture coming through the summer because this was um, effectively irrigated. And so what they did on the plains was they added nitrogen. Because if you add nitrogen with that water, then you can move from producing 10 tonnes of dry matter to producing 22 tonnes of dry matter. Half of the people on the planet today are alive because of the use of urea fertiliser. Without it, we'd still be at about 3 billion people. But we fed them because we have nitrogen fertiliser. So I'm not here to bag nitrogen fertiliser. There's a pun there, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, but if we go through and look at the irrigated minus nitrogen, this is, this is the one that, that I said was your summer safe. There's about over a year, there's your 10 tonnes. I've accounted for temperature, so I've got about 10 tonnes of dry matter. If I do a little quick conversion and say about 3.5% of that will be in, that tells me that I've got 350 kilos of nitrogen available from the soil because that's what I would have needed to grow that 10 tonnes of dry matter. So then I grow twice as quick if I have in in the system, twice as much because I've got 20 tonnes of dry matter. And so you can very quickly work out that if this required 300 or got me about 350 kilos of in, this is another 350 kilos of in to get to here, or potentially 400 kilos of in. And that's what the dairy farmers in the Canterbury Plains recognised, is that if you put more nitrogen on, you actually grow more feed. And that's what they've done. So there is a nitrogen gap. So you can see Im immediately if you're a government that's trying to reduce the use of urea fertiliser, you might want to put a restriction on. And if I put 190 kilos of N on, I could actually almost predict exactly what the yield is going to be for those dairy farmers. So some major systems changes required for um, our dairy systems that have become very reliant on the use of nitrogen fertiliser. And that's just the graphic showing what's happened since the 1990s in terms of urea um, use or nitrogen use in New Zealand. It's a major response and, and again I'm not knocking it, um, I'm recognising that nitrogen is the major driver of pasture production. That's all plants are nitrogen deficient. So nitrous oxide during application is what they're trying to reduce, the nitrous oxide being one of the more potent greenhouse gases. The one that really intrigued me though was this one. And that's what drove us into legumes, was saying, look, if we get nitrogen in the system when we have moisture, even in the middle of winter, we can grow more feed. And you can see that here, we can grow a lot more in spring and we can grow more in summer because we can respond to any rainfall and then any rainfall in autumn we can actually respond to as well. And so we shifted, we shifted from um, 6 to 16 tonnes of dry matter just by adding nitrogen to the system. Because all plants are nitrogen deficient all the time, except legumes. This is a truth. So basically plants use up nitrogen. Nitrate is not a devil's tool. Nitrate is the form of nitrogen in the soil that plants require to take up to actually grow. Everything you ate today was based on the use of nitrogen by a plant 
at some point, um, if you had wheat bix or you had toast or whatever you ate or you had milk, then actually nitrate being taken up by a plant was the most important process that happened to ensure that you could eat. But if we need nitrogen in the system, do we go down the track of putting a whole lot of nitrogen fertiliser on or do we head towards using legumes? And that's what we've been trying to do for the last 20 years is promote the use of legumes because we understand and recognise what the major deficiency is in our pasture production systems. And we've done that in our, in our Hill Country Futures program at the moment, we're actually monitoring on farm. Um, this is some data from Wilson Farm in, in Banks Peninsula. In their unimproved land, basically we've got some areas where they've put some loose in on some hills, and we can see the difference there, that the unimproved, right next door there's appeared cages, is producing about that six and a half tonnes that I showed you earlier, and the loose in is producing 14 tonnes of dry matter. The farmer knew he was producing more, but he hadn't done the measuring. If you don't measure, you don't know. And when we did this and showed his staff, they went, wow, okay, we knew it was a bit more difficult to shift the sheep around the lucerne, but now we understand why we were doing it. And we also know that if we want to grow animals from 5 to 35 kilos in 100 days, they have to do Peter Anderson's 300 plus grams per head per day that we're achieving here at Bon Avery. And to do that, the only things that'll do it are mostly clover-based pastures. If I want that 300 here, then it has to be an ME of 12, clover, good quality lucerne, rape or pasture, or mother's milk. That's the only way we can do it. We've got to have high quality feed. And also, that high quality feed allows us to deal with one of the other greenhouse gases, which is methane. Now, I'm, a, a, I'm approaching sort of the end of my career, not quite, but getting towards it, and every time I, I talk to someone about the Greenhouse Gas Consortium and when we're going to have a vaccine for um, ingesting into sheep or, or, or dealing with the rumen, it'll be 10 years. I haven't got many 10 years to wait and I've been asking for 10 years and it's still not quite there. I'd hope it comes, but I have a solution already to reduce methane and that is to grow animals quicker. If we grow animals fast and cut their heads off, they're no longer producing methane. I know that sounds brutal, but that's actually what is happening here at Bon Avery. That's what we're doing, is we're going, look, if we're growing 300 grams per head per day, they're on the farm for about 33 days, and Pete said that 16 days here for the um, period post weaning. The thing that happens is that because it's high quality feed, the rumen is slightly smaller because it doesn't have to get so big. Now that has some positives and some negatives. The positive is it's a small rumen and the rumen is a real energy requirer for the, for the animals. So a lot of its maintenance requirement is just keeping its rumen going. If I've got a smaller rumen, that maintenance requirement is reduced. Part of that problem is when I have a high quality diet, it can give me red gut because there's more space, there's more opportunity to give me some animal health issues. But growing animals fast is one way to reduce our methane footprint. It's not only having good quality feed, you've got to have enough of it. So this is really good quality feed, but it's too short. The advantage that the lucerne gives at Bon Avery is that Fraser is a magnificent manager of the plant. He understands that we can give these animals a really high quality diet, and then we shift them. We don't make them eat every last bit of stalk. It's shift them four hours earlier, make those decisions early so the animals are being shifted. Um, quickly, they have access to then a high quality and a high quantity of feed. We've got a plant that's fixing its no own nitrogen so I don't have to deal with the nitrous oxide. And the ME of that leaf is about 12, so we can achieve those high live weight gains that Pete was talking about. And we can deal with some of the animal health issues. This is a, a, a Doug Avery that I've exported around the world and he has too. Um, we know that if we get a really wet spring, not this one, but a really wet spring, there are potential for animal health issues. So mowing some strips in the paddocks um, 24, 48 hours before the animals go in actually provides the fibre, and they'll go in and they'll eat that fibre. And the advantage of that is that the quality of the lucerne in those strips is the same as the quality of the lucerne in the paddock and so you haven't got that differential that animals will choose to eat the highest quality feed. They'll actually go and eat that, and so they're full. 
And I think it works. I think it works. You know, they're still doing it, so it must be doing something. And Doug's story is, is well documented, and I could go through it, but I don't want to. What I wanted to actually talk about was Doug's failure, because I think that's more important and more pertinent. What I learned from my interaction with Doug was that most farmers over time have a farm system that they've optimised. They know how their farm operates. And we come along and we suggest that they put in a new cultivar or they try some fertiliser or something, and we try and help them get to this plateau here. But at some point, they're going to have optimised their farm and they know how it operates. And then someone like me comes along and says, I want you to do something completely different. I want you to do some lucerne grazing. We need to expect that that's not going to be plain sailing, that there will be problems. If I, I was mentioning last night, if you hadn't skied and I said to you, you've got to go skiing tomorrow, you're not going to be good at it the first time you try it. It's the same when you implement a new technology on farm. We've got to expect and allow each other to have failure, to have a drop in output as we learn those skills. Doesn't matter what it might be, if I give you a new truck, a new cell phone or a new grazing system, you're going to take time to learn it. The problem we have is that there's a huge risk of reversion at that point. I put in a paddock of lucerne, didn't grow, not going to do that again. And the difficulty we have in the industry is not only do, am I not going to do it again, there's no way my son is going to do it, and maybe his grandson isn't going to do it either, because he's not going to be allowed because granddad tried that. And that's what we see. So we're looking for this transformational change, and I think the document, the handout that you've got is a really good example of transformational change. What we're trying to do is ensure that with science, agribusiness, education, that we reduce this period of negative output and the risk of reversion. And I use that diagram because I think it should be empowering, and I think Doug's story is incredibly empowering, because it says, I tried and I failed, but I didn't stop, I tried again. I got some people around me to help, and it worked. And I think that's the message, that's the story that really is the most pertinent one out of the Avery journey um, to their success that they experience today. They've also exported, sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously. Um, Dave Gundy and Lisa Anderson, I met them in, in um, 2008, Lisa had been a student at Lincoln, but they heard about the 2008 field day. And so, and this is some data put together by Stock Care from Pete Anderson. In 2008, um, when I met them, they were trying to get the farm ready to sell because they had tenure review, they had water rights to renew, they had succession to deal with, and they were struggling with what to do. And they heard the Avery story and said, well, can we try and do something like that on our farm? At that point, they had about 30 hectares of lucerne that they cut and carried to get through their 120 days of winter. And then gradually over time, they increased the area of lucerne. And the first thing that happened is the ewe condition score increased. And so we went from 90 tonnes of lamb weaned to about 110 tonne of weaned lamb. And then because the ewes are in better condition, we actually increased lamb survival. And after the lamb survival, that here there was actually a little bit of irrigation that was turned off in that particular year. I mean, it was dry, so things weren't so good. And then the irrigation got transferred and now we're looking at around 140, 150 tonne of weaned lamb. And it was the inspiration that the Averys gave that encouraged these people. Bogroy Station is 450 mil rainfall near Odomatata. It's dry. Encouraged them to do that. The first thing that happened is for the first six or seven years, uh, sorry, the first four or five years, there really wasn't an increase in the number of ewes. It was actually just their condition. And one of the things that Pete said was that the ewes on um, Bon Avery are in good condition. The ewe is the queen, after Shelley and Wendy, of course. <laughs> um, the other thing that happened is the growth rates have increased. So the growth rates of the animals have gone up um, from here. Uh, this is merinos, so you know merinos are not going to do quite as well, but we're looking at 180, and now we're looking around that sort of 280, 300 grams per head per day for merinos. So really good performance out of that farm. 
And the other thing that's really important in that environment is the number of days to weaning. So we've gone from 120 days to weaning to around 85. And, and I, Pete sort of kept going in my ear, but look at the number of days of weaning. And I didn't sort of twig because I'm a bit slow sometimes. And then I went, ah, oh, yeah, what's happening is the ewes are in much better condition when they go back out on the hills. They haven't spent another month losing weight. Not only are they in better condition, the lambs are then in good condition as well. The hills had a chance to recover and the whole thing's working better. And their production gains, um, we didn't have them from 2008, but from an income perspective, um, they've doubled to almost triple, two and a half times their lamb income from using lucerne as a feed base. There's now about 230 hectares of lucerne on that property. The first time we grazed, the neighbours came and said, you better get down the paddock, there's ewes and lambs on your lucerne, because traditionally it was cut and carried. <laughs> and the landscape farming approach that Doug pioneered has also been transported elsewhere. So this is saying, look, there's the deep soil, that's what I'll take. Why would I take all of the um, land and put it all into lucerne? Let's put the right plant in the right place. And that really was pioneered here at Bon Avery, that we heard about the, the resources. I, I, I'm ple this is 2010 when Doug was still um, in the range and he sent me this photo, most happy about the tagasasti that he planted here in the foreground. Oh, that one's saltbush. Yeah, okay, that one's saltbush, sorry. Um, but you can see what's happened in the landscape and then last year, or this year when I was up, um, Fraser inadvertently, without questioning, said, well, I've just retired this bit of land because it's not very productive, it's very north-facing, it's highly erosion-prone, and I've planted some trees. And that's what we've done as an industry, and that's what was reported that was alluded to earlier in um, the fact that our greenhouse gas emissions, our absolute emissions, have gone down by about 30%, and we're either 63 or 120, depending on where you are, was an ecologist who did it, so he's sort of not too precise. <laughs> but it's not that precise to be able to do, but whichever way you look at it, it's a good news story, and I applaud Beef and Lamb for having commissioned the work to get it. We're in a good space. We've decreased our ewe numbers over time. We've decreased the um, lambs marked or tailed, but we've increased our performance. And it's been our lambing percentages that have gone up, which we saw has happened on this farm. We've increased the carcass weight that we've produced off each of those lambs, and therefore we've reduced our methane emissions per unit of production quite dramatically. This is a good news story. This is not a news story I hear very much. But it is a good news story. We've been a very uh, responsive industry to all of those drivers without necessarily them being the targets of what we were doing. Simply the targets of productivity, understanding the plants and the landscape has given us um, these advantages. So in conclusion, um, climate change influences government policy because the government has obligations internationally that it has to deal with. Regardless of which government it is, they will have to deal with those international policies. And we're going to have to deal with the fact that government policy is going to impact on all of us, whether we're rural or urban. It's going to happen. Plants require nitrogen. Without nitrogen, we don't grow very much. And as I drove through from um, the Marlborough Sounds today, I, I, I came through and saw all of the nitrogen deficient pasture with the urine patches sitting in it. All that lack of potential sitting there lost because it's not being utilised as appropriately as it could be. So we can reduce our nitrogen and nitrous oxide emissions by strategic use of nitrogen, but don't lose sight of the fact that plants require nitrogen to grow. It's where we get it from that matters. There's a little bit of nitrogen fertiliser used on this farm, a little bit strategically when you need it. We can reduce methane emissions by focusing on the things we're good at, increasing productivity, growing animals as fast as we can, producing more meat for each kilo of methane that we um, emit. We can't stop the methane emissions from a rumen, it's going to happen. And we can reduce our CO2 footprint by retiring those bits of land 
that aren't that productive, that possibly in the first place shouldn't really have been cleared. And we can do that if we're profitable and doing well on the rest of the farm. And so for me, the Averys are an exemplar of this success. They've adapted their farm without really knowing it, but they've, they're actually leading globally in a way to farm to deal with the, the, the biggest potential issue we have of climate change. So I applaud what you've done. I'm delighted to have been a part of the journey. And um, I'm really pleased that you've had days like this to share it with other people. I think sheep and beef can rightly or soon market products as being carbon neutral. And wouldn't that be a good place to be? So just going back to that question at the start, so you had the chart at the end showing a reduction in emissions per, per unit of food. So where do we sit internationally? You had, all, had the per capita emissions. Yeah, so what's happened to our production of um, food? What's our cost per unit of food? Um, we're actually not the best. If you really wanted to have the lowest emissions per unit of food, it's really difficult to do it on a pasture-based system. So you'd go to a total mixed ration. And so there's a lot of work being done trying to do life cycle analysis, comparing, for example, a New Zealand grass-fed system versus a Swedish milk production system or a US total mixed ration system. And um, effectively what they show is it's difficult to to work out from that analysis which has the lowest emissions per unit of production. But there's two parts go with that. One is without question ours is the lowest cost system. The other is that in each of those systems they've actually adapted to the resources they've got. So if you've got large areas of open plain that you can crop, then you crop and we've industrialised or created factory farms. We haven't got that. What we've done is adapt and create an efficient system for our more hill country sort of environment. So it's difficult to say this is better than this. Actually what's happened over time is the production systems have become the most efficient for the environment that they're working in. The difficulty you get is when you go into a total mixed ration sort of diet and you start saying I want to reduce inputs, you end up in a situation like Norway where you'd go to Norway and you'd buy fish and it's been um, produced in fjord and they'll call it wild fish. 60% of the feed is soya meal that came from South America. You do the same when you go to Europe and you eat, you, you drink the milk or you eat the meat. 60% of the feed was soya bean that came from South America. For the South Americans that's fantastic. They've got some production coming out of there but they may be destroying other parts. If, you, if we went to a whole organic system, the meta-analyses suggest that we'll drop production by about 20%. For the global output, we then need to increase the amount of land we have by 20%. So it's difficult to do systems with systems. Yes, so the, the question is, has anyone thought about um, adding soil organic matter? No one's counting it. Yep, and, and I'm not here as an apologist. I'm simply going to answer your question. Yes, that we have grown soil on the plains as we've irrigated because we put fertiliser on, we grow animals and um, we actually increase the... the and every farm in New Zealand. The difficulty with trying to count those carbons, they're not included in our um, carbon counting. They're not included and they're not going to be. And our carbon, soil carbon levels are actually um, plateaued. It takes about 20 years to build up soil carbon levels from, let's say, a depleted um, plains or continuous cropping environment, putting pasture in, it takes about 20 years before you plateau. And most of New Zealand is actually sitting at that plateau of carbon level. When we cultivate, then we actually release some of that carbon, so we've got to go through. It just becomes very difficult. One of the reasons for direct drilling is we retain that carbon in the soil um, rather than cultivation which, which releases the carbon of the atmosphere. And I'm not here to apologise for the fact whether it's being counted or not being counted. Yep. So the question is, um, would I care to comment on the use of eucalyptus and agroforestry in um, the landscape? And I think that's actually what we're trying to encourage is the trees in the right place and I think that's what the Averys are doing. Um, if we move to a full agroforestry system we will actually reduce production because we 
stop life interception as much. And we've done we did a lot of that work at Lincoln. Um, so there's a balance between trees on farm and uh, using the pastures that we have. And I think the sheep and beef sector has actually done a pretty good job. It, and it's not saying we're, we're there, but we've done a good job of trying to integrate trees onto the farming landscape. Um, and I think the figures in that report are about 2 million hectares has been retired to, um, to woody vegetation of some description. So it's happening, and as the drivers come, people will look at those um, in more detail. And, and it will be, each individual farm will do that where it can, and I think we're already seeing that. So Robin um, is pointing out that I'm underselling Lucerne. <laughs> I think that's the first time anyone has ever <laughs> said that I'm underselling Lucerne. Um, but yeah, there, there are a whole lot of additional benefits. Now, it may not be Lucerne that works on your farm, but there are a whole lot of additional benefits from having a high-protein diet. Um, we don't hear much about drenches and those sorts of things because the way that the plant operates is we tend to find we have high-protein reduction in the um, requirement for, for drenching or animal parasite issues. Um, the, the ewes are healthy, they're heavy, and they're growing well because they're getting a high protein diet. So, you know, it, it's not just lucerne, it's legumes in general that provide those animal health. There's no perfect plant. You can try lucerne and you'll have some horrendous problems, Doug has. Um, but if you get it right, then the potential benefits are not only for your farm system, but as I tried to indicate here, I think at this point, as I come towards, it's not the end of my career, but you know, I've had 25 years at it, I can't come up with a better system that ticks the boxes of reducing the requirement uh, for nitrogen fertiliser, growing the animals as fast as I can, and being sympathetic with the, the landscape that it's operating in.